and uh, it was my uncle's 90th birthday party, and they're all Reformed Jews, so they don't like the Orthodox. So I had to lose the beard, or I would never have heard the end of it. Um, so it's like I fell into a lawnmower that was, all, <laughs> that was also a time machine, because uh, my son said that I, I moved forward a hundred years, because I looked like an Orthodox Jew from a hundred years ago, and uh, I lost 20 years, because I looked 20 years younger, apparently. <laughs> Uh, so now I'm like this, and uh, my wife prefers me like this. So until I get back to, to yeah, <laughs> she's nicer to kiss apparently. Um, so I'm now trying to uh, fit back into British culture, where we're clean shaven. But I actually feel inside like I'm a ultra orthodox Jew. Now, if we can switch to my PowerPoint, I'll just take a moment to do that. It's just great to be with you and uh, I've come all the way from darkest where in Hertfordshire. Uh, that roundabout you mentioned, the Amwell roundabout, I've just passed there. You know Van Hague's just yeah. after, yeah, just past the garden centre. I'm in Postwood Road up, up on the left. It's very nice. And um, I've been there now, we've been there about 20 years because I got the job teaching at All Nations, and Brenda was there in the nursery, is that right? And you remember when my son was something like 13, he had a, a Messianic Jewish bar mitzvah at All Nations, and he's now 25. So uh, been here a while, and so it's lovely to be with you here today, and had a great time at the Passover meal, and uh, now I'm here to share a bit more. And uh, I hope that you'll be, uh, in, I hope I'll stay in contact. It's great to be in a church where God is really at work mm -hmm. and to hear all these stories and testimonies of signs and wonders and dreams and vision and the power of God. That really it just refreshes my spirit. So thank you for your invitation, Bethany, and it's great to meet you all. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a bit about um, the Jewish understanding of being born again. And uh, if being born once haven't given you much satisfaction, try being born again. Uh, but I also want to set that in the context of how Jesus was talking to his own people and especially to the rabbis of his day. So uh, I'll be doing that. And if you'd like to follow along the Bible passage, it's a very familiar passage in John's Gospel, uh, John chapter 3 and verse, uh, well I'll read from verse 1, uh, but I expect many of us know John three sixteen. So uh, in the, um, the church Bibles, uh, I think it's page 1065, do you have that? Uh, so John's Gospel, Gospel of John, chapter 3, page 1065, and if you want to follow along, uh, with the PowerPoint, and do they discuss this later? I know you're recording this, aren't you? So, yeah, yeah. But I'll send you all the PowerPoints as well. I, I like to do that, uh, and it will give you a bit of homework to do as well. So, um, are you with me so far? Yes. Yeah. And uh, I'll I'll start my stopwatch just in case because you've given me a. Uh, Oh, we've got the top, top there as well. Okay. Um, but I will go through John 3 and I'll also talk a bit about what I've been doing in Jerusalem and ask you to pray for that if you're interested. So, John chapter 3, page 1065, beginning at verse 1. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. 
Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, or in the Greek it says the teacher of Israel, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Let's read the next couple of verses together, shall we, if you want to follow with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Let's pray for a moment. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we know, Lord, that your word is living and active. And so, Lord, we ask that you will speak to us by your Spirit to show us more about Yeshua, Jesus. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So I've been uh, spending quite a bit of time in Jerusalem amongst ultra-Orthodox, strict religious Jews. And when you meet them, they're lovely people. But it's also so hard to communicate. And especially when you come from a background of believing in Jesus, and yet you're talking to people who are still waiting for the Messiah, and they don't believe that Jesus is for them, because most of them have never met a Christian who's shown them love. And so uh, I've been thinking a lot about what this man Nicodemus was like. If you, can you see these slides okay at the back? You might like just to turn the lights off at the front and then it will show the black and white a bit more easily. So Nicodemus, he's a leader. And in fact, his name, Nicodemus, you know, names are very important in the Bible, aren't they? So I'm getting to know your family. I'm trying to remember. It's Bethany, house of humble or Greek, yeah. And it's Rebecca, Rivka. Do you know what that means? Devoted. Or a yoked calf. My daughter's Rebecca as well. And then you have an Esther. Do you know what that means? Ishtar, a star, and it's also the way they translated the Hebrew word Daphna, which means the myrtle. And then you have a Hannah, is that right? Yes. Do you know what Hannah means? God's grace, yeah. And your Deborah. other, Deborah, a busy bee, buzzing, yeah. <laughs> so in Hebrew thought, if you know, or Jewish life, if you know someone's name, you actually know a lot about them. So Nicodemus is actually like the word Nike. I'm sure you don't have Nike sports goods, do you? It means victory. And I was really hoping today that I would come and preach on England's victory in the World Cup final. Yeah. <laughs> and I was going to say the goal of our faith is this. But sadly, Harry Kane, although he's the Golden Boot Award, hasn't won that. So I can't preach about England winning the World Cup. Was anybody there in 1966? Yeah, yeah I remember it. Yeah. Uh, that will be for another day. Uh, Nike means victory. So Nicodemos means a ruler of the demos, the people. Democracy is the rule of the people. So Nicodemus is a leader who rules the people and actually his work, his Greek name is based on the Hebrew name Balaam. You remember Balaam who had the donkey? 
and the donkey was a better prophet than Balaam was. But Nicodemus then, he's got a good Jewish name underneath his Greek name. He's a member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling council, so he's responsible for all the official decisions. He's a Pharisee. Perush is the Hebrew for to divide or separate. Now, Brenda remembers me up at All Nations trying to get everyone to speak Hebrew. Don't worry if you don't speak Hebrew yet. You will when you get to heaven. (laughs) So you can start learning the language now. Let's say the word perush means to separate. The Pharisees were separating themselves off from the others being very religious, a bit like the Countess of Huntingdon Connection Churches. (laughs) But also they were very strict in separating out the different parts of the law. So Nicodemus is really a very strict religious leader and that head of a yeshiva, a training college for rabbis, because in the Hebrew, in the Greek, it says, are you the teacher of Israel? Which is a, a technical term for that. And yet, I think he was a secret disciple, a secret believer. And one of the things I've been most interested in, in Jerusalem, is meeting secret disciples. And there are even people in Chesant who are secret believers. And they keep it to themselves. And even some of us sometimes. So Nicodemus comes by night. He's a conqueror of the people. He keeps his faith in secret. And yet, towards the end, he really shows it with a lavish gift for the burial of Jesus. He brings 33 kilograms of myrrh and spices, thousands of pounds, which you'd have to pay to anoint Jesus' body. And this is a friend of mine in, let me see if my little, oh yeah, it works. I I love playing with gadgets. So uh, (laughs) uh, that's my friend. And I won't even say his name because he's a secret believer. He's been a believer in Jesus some 50 years. And he's a rabbi. And he's taught in a training college for rabbis. And you go and visit him in the back streets of uh, Jerusalem, the ultra-Orthodox area, And he keeps it quiet, but he really believes in Jesus. And I often think that Nicodemus is a bit like this. And in Islam and in Judaism and in other faiths, there are many secret disciples of Jesus. Now, what did Jesus mean? Yeshua, by the way, is the name Jesus in Hebrew. Let's say that together. Yeshua. And it means God to the rescue. What does it mean? God to the rescue. You think Jesus is like a Greek form of Yeshua, God to the rescue. He says you've got to be born again. In he in the Greek, it's born either from above by the Holy Spirit or from up, from like going into your, be- your mother's womb again and being born again. And he says unless you're born again, unless you have a new start with the help of the Holy Spirit, You cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, what does it mean, the kingdom of God? It's the place where God is in charge. God rules. And in Hebrew, it's the word Malchut Hashemayim. And when I was growing up, we sung a song. Malchut ha, malchut kol olam mihihihim humin shaltacha, le kol It's a bit catchy, my voice is not brilliant. It means your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion will go forever. It's a way of saying God's in charge. But we can't really enter into that kingdom unless we are, as uh, Jesus says, born again. Now, what did that mean for Nicodemus? Did it mean, like that little baby, you can re-enter the room? He's an old man. He's probably in his 60s or 70s or 80s or something like that. And yet, we can't see God in charge unless we have that experience. Are you with me so far? There's six different ways in the Jewish tradition that you can become a new creation. Did you know that? 
It's, it's not just Billy Graham saying, you must be born again. And wasn't Billy Graham a dear man and a wonderful servant of God? And I was fortunate to meet him a couple of times over the years. We think as Christians that being born again is, is the act of becoming a Christian. It is. But for Jewish people, being born again was quite a common phrase. And they had about six different ways that you could be born or born again. And of course, the first time is when you're a baby. And if you're a Jewish boy, you're circumcised on the eighth day and you're given your name. And Jewish people believe that when you're born, you start with a clean slate. So one of the prayers is, oh, my God, the soul which you gave me is pure. You created it. You fashioned it. You breathed it into me. That's from the morning prayers in the synagogue service. Now, as Christians, we believe that we've inherited the sinful human nature from Adam. That we're not that pure. Or if we are, we learn very quickly not to be so pure. And like your young Romeo there and all the others, I can hear that, you know, you only need to see it in young children to realise we're not that pure. And on the eighth day, you, if you're a Jewish boy, you have your circumcision. It's a painful snip. I won't go into details. The mother remembers it more than the son. Uh, but um, that's the first way you could be born again, by being actually born. And uh, the second way, who's this? Yeah, do you remember her? Now, one of the things about her, which is interesting, she converted to Judaism. She became a Jew. And uh, when a non-Jew, a Gentile, converts to becoming a Jew, it's as if they are born again, according to the rabbis. Like they, they have new parents. Their parents become Abraham, the father of all the faithful. And uh, in the time of Jesus, to be born again as a non-Jew who became a Jew, you would have to take a sacrifice, an offering to the temple. You would have to have a baptism, an immersion in a mikvah, a pool of water. And if you're a man, again, you've got a painful snip. I won't go into detail. This is why not many men do the full conversion job. Um, now, when I was here at the Passover meal, there was a family, a couple here, and they they were just off to Jamaica. Is that right? Yes. For their daughter's wedding. Are, are they here today? I don't know. And my cousin, who's a rabbi, took the wedding service. So they told me about it before the service, and then I got back to my uncle's 90th birthday, and I had to shave because they're Reformed Jews; they don't like the beards. And she was telling me all about it. I had a lovely time. It was a great wedding. And of course, that is a conversion to Judaism, another way of being born again. Now, I wouldn't recommend that, by the way. Uh, but here's a way that Nicodemus was thinking about being born again. If a man from the house of David was crowned king over Israel... And uh, when I was growing up in synagogue, I come from London really, but I came up to Ware to teach at All Nations Christian College. When I was growing up in synagogue, we sung this song. Let me try and sing it with you. David Melech Yisrael. Can you try that? David Melech Yisrael. The next bit goes. Hi, hi, Vakayam. Hi, hi, Vakayam. David Melech Israel, hi, hi, Vakayam. Try that. David Melech Israel, hi, hi, Vakayam. That means David, he's the king of Israel. He lives and he will arise again. Isn't that amazing? Because Jewish people are still waiting, most of us, for the son of David to come. And rise again. And so when a Jewish person is crowned king over Israel, it's as if they're born again. Now Nicodemus didn't want to become king because if he did, the Romans would put him to death. 
and he, we don't know if he was from the line of David, but uh, that's one way that you could be born again in the Jewish life. Another way is your bar mitzvah. Now, my son Josh and my daughter Rebecca both had Messianic Jewish bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah. The age of 13 where the father is no longer responsible for the sins of their son or their daughter. And the son at the age of 13, he can get married, he can buy a house, he can go into business. But really it's just the start of being a teenager. Uh, and so at the age of 13, you're called up to read the Torah, the law, the Jewish law, and you are seen as an adult in the eyes of the Jewish community. And many people say, well, did Jesus have a bar mitzvah because he's there in the temple, you remember? His mother can't find him. And uh, he's still in the temple talking to the leaders. Now, I don't think this was an actual bar mitzvah because I don't know any Jewish mother who would miss, who would miss their son's bar mitzvah. You've got a year of arranging a party and get, getting the caterers together and everything else. Uh, but Jesus, at that age, he's a responsible adult. Liberal Jews and my cousin, the rabbi, they have their confirmation service at the age of 13 as well. So I think that's another way that Nicodemus thought about being born again. And the fourth way, are you still with me okay? Yeah. When you get married. Now, I would love a photo of your family who got married in Jamaica because it's a bit like that. They stand under a wedding hooper. They're standing there by the beach. And a matchmaker has probably arranged it, if it's orthodox, or maybe they've fallen in love. And they have this lovely service. And then the, uh, they stand under a wedding canopy. And, uh, oops, I've got that one. And uh, in the end of the service, the husband stamps his foot on the ground and breaks a glass. Did you know that? Yes. And everybody says, muzzle tov. Congratulations. So if anybody ever breaks a plate in your kitchen or in the restaurant, to share, to avoid the embarrassment, just say muzzle tov. Congratulations. <laughs> now, why does the husband put his foot down and break a glass? Well, it's a sign of mourning for the destruction of the temple of Jerusalem. You know, the temple was destroyed in the year 70. And so even in the happiest time of marriage, you have a sign of mourning that you're waiting for the temple to be rebuilt. And only the Messiah can do that. And some people say it's the last time that the man ever gets to put his foot down again. <laughs> I'm sure that's not true. My wife, my wife told me to say that. So... Uh, <laughs> That's also when you're born again in Jewish life, when you get married. And some of us who are married know that it's, it's quite an experience. It is like being born again. But it's not the spiritual born again. And then a fifth way, I'm going through my six ways, and, and I'd hope you do some homework later, is when you are ordained as a rabbi, when you become an official teacher. And people say to me, Richard, are you a doctor or are you a rabbi or a vicar or whatever? I'm, I'm not a rabbi in the sense <coughs> that my cousin is, but I, I'm still a teacher. But when you're ordained as a rabbi, it's as if you are born again. You are accepting the authority of the law and you start teaching it. So this man here, you see, he's bound across his arm. The cords of what's called the tefillin, the phylacteries. And you wear those every day to pray. And in the morning you put them on your head and you wind them around your arm. So they're over your heart. And you've got the words of the law that you're remembering as you pray. Nicodemus has been through that as well. So maybe he thinks that's what being born again is. <coughs> and then the final way... This is my friend who I travelled back from Israel with just a couple of weeks ago. And, for, you know, has anybody been to Israel? Mm. Yes. It's, it's wonderful trips. The trip of a lifetime. Yeah. You go to Luton Airport, you get on EasyJet. If it's on time, it takes you four and a half hours. 
And if you look for cheap fares, you can get a good deal. And if you want to do a tour, I can give you some recommendations. So I get on the flight and I'm always praying, who am I going to be sitting next to? And I get next to this man. I'll call him Herschel. It's not his real name. But as soon as I sit down, he sits down, he starts praying and praying and praying and praying for a safe journey. And then he gets out his Hebrew Bible, a big Hebrew book, and he starts reading the Psalms. So I get out my iPad and I start reading the Psalms on my iPad. It, and my iPad, it, it looks a bit, it's, it looks like a Hebrew book as well. And he's reading Psalm 51, you know, which is about David's sin and create in me a pure heart and restore to me the joy of salvation. And then he starts studying and studying and at the end we talk and we talk about Psalm 51 and how we can have a pure heart, a restored heart. And this man is a teacher of the law. He's the teacher in a college for rabbis, a bit like All Nations Christian College. Has anybody been up there? They do lovely cream teas up there now. So go for a cream tea sometime. Uh, I'm still teaching there as well, so you might see me around. Uh, this man, he prays and he reads the Psalms and then he spends the four-hour flight studying his books. And we're talking together and I realise he's given his whole life to teaching and learning the law, the Torah. And I asked everybody, because I've been learning about getting into these conversations, I said to him, what's your secret What's your secret for learning God's word? And he gave me an answer I haven't heard before. He said, it's in the jeans. And he wasn't wearing jeans. <laughs> it's that his family, his father and his father's father and his father's father's father have grown up studying. And they study 10 to 15 hours a day. They send the wife out to work. Or to have eight children. Uh, so it's not quite, it wouldn't quite work in Chesson. But, well, you've got four, so you've got a good start. Um, but the way that ultra-Orthodox Jews live is, the best thing you can do with your time is to study the Torah, the Jewish law. And that's why Jesus says to Nicodemus, are you the teacher? Ha didaskalos in the Greek. As if he's talking to the head of a yeshiva. Are you still with me okay? Yes. I, I just had such a blessing in the last few months talking to probably more than a hundred ultra-Orthodox Jews, meeting them in the streets, picking them up as hitchhikers, meeting them on the aeroplane, getting into long conversations. And I'm so pleased that even though I've lost my beard, they still want to talk to me. Because uh, without the beard, you look like a secular Israeli. But with the beard, you look like you're part of this community. Uh, and I'm learning, I'm trying to write a book on it at the moment, how to share your faith with ultra-Orthodox Jews. So really, we know, because I hope that you're experiencing that today, being born again is when a new relationship with God begins. Old things pass away or are seen in a new light. And you are in a new state of being. Your sins are forgiven. Otherwise you're just carrying guilt and burdens and the heavy weight. But once Jesus sets us free, we're set free to be all that we're meant to be. And I'm a nice Jewish boy who grew up in London, went to synagogue, but I didn't believe in God. And it wasn't until my two friends, Simon and Michael, asked me, who do you think Jesus is? That I had an experience. I'd now call it a vision. They said to me, what do you think happened when Jesus died on the cross? And why were the disciples so excited that first Easter weekend? And I like to think of myself as a cold-minded, rational, analytical sort of person. I hope my students think that when, they, when I mark their essays. But I had what I would now describe as a vision. I saw an empty tomb. And I realised that Jesus had risen from the dead. 
Now, I was gobsmacked. I said to them, well, perhaps you're right. Perhaps Jesus did rise from the dead, but I'm Jewish. We're not supposed to believe that. But you know, when God comes knocking at the door, you can't keep the door shut. You have to open the door and let him in. And that's why Jesus says the wind blows where it will. Now, the miracle of the parting of the Red Sea wasn't so much that the wind came, but that Moses just happened to be there right when it came. (laughs) It does get windy. I used to teach this in my Old Testament history course. Every one of the ten plagues you can explain naturally. The rivers turning to blood can be the pollution, the plague of frogs because they arise out of the polluted waters, the blight on the cattle. All these are natural phenomena, but with God they become supernatural as well. Because it's just at the right time when these Hebrew slaves are told to prepare the Passover. If you didn't come to our lovely Passover meal, we had a great time. I've never done a Passover in a Toby pub before. (laughs) It was very nice. I didn't have the beer because you're not supposed to. Um, But the miracles are when God incidences happen at just the right time. And that's why there's nothing more natural than the supernatural. And we shouldn't make a big distinction between them because when God's power comes on us at particular times and in particular ways, you just have to go with it. It's great to know that God is at work here and to hear these stories of healings and miracles and deliverances. And that's what Nicodemus was looking for. He was still caught up in the system of trying to work your way to God by good deeds. And at the end of the day, none of us can get there just by our good deeds. And Jesus calls him to receive the Holy Spirit and to be born again into a new family and to become a learner, a disciple. Are you born again? I hope so. I don't know. Only God knows. And that's why my family, I've told you a little bit about my background. They come from Germany. My English name is Richard Harvey. It's a very nice English name, isn't it? Would you like some Harvey's Bristol Cream Sherry? (laughs) But my father was born Anthony Adolf Hirschland, which is a German Jewish name. And the Hirschlands came from a town in Germany called Essen. And there's a lot of them. And then my grand, my, my great grandfather, Richard Hirschland, I'm named after him, Richard Harvey, came. Uh, and this was the uh, family house. And this was the family bank, because they were a banking family. And now all we have is a public square, Hirschland Platz, and an underground station. It's an underground station in Essen. Has anybody been to Essen in Germany? I'd rather have the bank and the house, but we've got an underground station. (laughs) And uh, then they came over, my great-grandfather Richard. This was the synagogue in Germany. And on the wall of the synagogue, there's a plaque with Brothers Hirschland as some of the people that gave money for the building of the synagogue. But then in 1938... The synagogue was set fire to, and all the Jewish people had to escape. And uh, my family, unfortunately, my great grandfather was already here, but some of his brothers and many of his family did not escape, and they died in the Holocaust, where six million Jewish people were put to death. And so my grandfather, uh, my great, my father's name was changed from Anthony. Adolf Hirschland, because Adolf was a popular boy's name until a certain Adolf Hitler came along. And uh, he became Anthony Harvey, good English name. And I became a believer in Jesus in 1973, before some of you were born, but not all of you. And uh, I was part of a messianic group, Jews who believe in Jesus in London, married to Monica, two children, and now three grandchildren, and my story is in this book, 
but I'm Jewish. A Jew for Jesus tells his story. And uh, I'm going to give you a free copy today if you sign up to receive my prayer updates. There you are. So nothing's really for free, but um, <laughs> in these days of GDPR, you know what that is? Yeah. Even if you're already receiving our newsletter and prayer letter, is anybody receiving a Jews? Yeah. yeah, we do. We have to get your agreement that we can send you emails or send something. So if you'd like a free copy and you haven't got one already, or if you have, you want to give one to a friend, please fill in the form uh, which you've got here. Did you just pull out the form for a moment? And uh, are you still with me, by the way? Yeah. It's not a normal sermon, don't worry, but I don't know what a normal sermon is here. So. And uh, if you'd like a free copy of my book, But I'm Jewish, uh, fill in with your name and address, and if you have the envelope, you can give it back to me in the envelope as well. And uh, normally this costs £4, so if you want to buy a copy, that's fine. But if you'd like a free copy, fill in the form with your name and address, and give me permission to send you prayer updates. In this modern world of GDPR, we've come to that. I uh, ask your permission to ask you to pray for me on a regular basis. But don't worry about that if, if it's not your interest. But let me just tell you that my family, my father became a believer in Jesus, my brother became a believer in Jesus, and my grandfather at the age of 78 so you're never too old to change your mind. And what I found is that more and more Jewish people are coming to believe in Jesus. And uh, the conclusion is this, that you can't enter the kingdom of God any other way. The six different ways that Nicodemus already knew didn't count. Being born, becoming a, a converting from being a Gentile to being a Jew, having your bar mitzvah, getting married, becoming a rabbi, becoming the head of a yeshiva, a training college, that didn't count. You have to be born by the Holy Spirit coming into your life as you accept Jesus as the Messiah. So if being born once hasn't given you much satisfaction, try being born again. And Paul's prayer for his people, brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they may be saved. And so we are called, as the dear Duchess of Huntingdon was so passionate about, to share the good news of Jesus with all nations. And for me, that's starting at the House of Israel. Now, do I have time to show you a quick update of a video?